Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the theater. I certainly hope you are enjoying your summer. Though it may not brim with the chills of autumn, nor the mystery that fills the air in such abundance, I do believe that this season holds its own tokens of dark enchantment. As the temperatures rise, the nights shorten, but within those brief passages of dusk to dawn are restless evenings. We may find ourselves tempted to forego sleep, to take in the warm air long after sunset, to join the streets after dark, or dwell in the quiet of our homes. The surfaces we leave vacant no longer grow cold by morning. Everything brims with a subtle warmth. The world has unveiled a nocturnal side, and if we do sleep, we may stir in the earliest hours of morning to see the sky ready to awaken with a feverish energy. In this, we may discover a newfound appreciation, existing in the hours of darkness, and wittingly or no, we will have embodied the ease by which a nightmare, devil or villain, breathes in this gloomy environment, with confidence, with rapture, without a second thought. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. This is Mania. Our story takes us to a time when the night really did usher in a whole new realm of mystery. A time when even the inner darkness of our own bodies was an ample source of questions. The events you are about to hear took place in the mid-17th century in a rural part of Northern Ireland, the village of Clowker in County Tyrone. This village always was something of an oddity, even today. It has barely 500 residents. But before I unveil to you the horrors of a family within this village, I would like to thank all the patrons of this show. All of the work behind this is done by one individual. So if you'd like to keep Mania independent and its host supported, please visit patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm to contribute a subscription. And now, with no further interruptions... Sarah McKenna was as eccentric as the strange little hamlet that raised her. She was quiet, with large, gray, inquisitive eyes often carrying an expression that was difficult to read. As was common in that time, she was married at the young age of 16. Within her first year of marriage, she gave birth to a son. It was, according to her, a speedy and easy delivery, and a swift recovery after. The child was named after the father, John and thus began the small family's life. Throughout puberty, Sarah experienced difficulty with her menstrual cycle. This difficulty returned after her first child was born. The household took on the tension of Sarah's inability to carry another child, and in such a small village, where a family's workforce was expected to come from its children, the pressures only piled on. Like a lot of places in Ireland, Clocker held an unmistakable beauty. The mossy green tones of the lush countryside, the cliff faces barricading the shores, and above it all, the overcast skies that seemed to knit everything closer together. And though small, the village had a cathedral. It, along with its quaint graveyard, was a dominant feature in the area. To someone like Sarah, confined to a simple, laborious life, a struggle with pregnancy threatened to become her whole world, an ongoing source of anxiety and certainly no comfort from the gossip that so often swelled in such tight communities. To avoid this, Sarah shut herself in, and at odds with her husband, over the years her son, John, became one of her only saving graces. As the years went on, several miscarriages took place. Her whole world grew darker. Before fraught with disappointment, now it was plagued with grief. With the miscarriages came abdominal pains that worsened, but in a rural town in the middle of the 18th century, such pains would go without medical treatment. Rather grit your teeth and press on, than ship oneself off to Dublin, or other such cities where an experienced doctor would be readily available. But such a trip was costly. Physical pains were almost the least of her worries. Though Sarah kept to herself, whispers from others in the village reached her eventually. There was talk that she was going mad. Without a shade of doubt, where other wives were birthing large families, 
Sarah's difficulty in doing so was thought to not just be a physical abnormality, but a kind of curse. Rumors suggested that she was not only shadowed by the grief of her miscarriages, but that it was degrading her sanity, and in her solitude, she spoke with herself even more than her husband. When Sarah confronted her husband about these rumors, he would grow quiet. This only unsettled her more. It was the silence of somebody carrying a terrible truth, only growing heavier each moment, and yet somehow, the pain of unveiling it would be far worse than the trouble of keeping it. Once more, her son was the only source of comfort, perhaps the only reassurance she felt in that hamlet, a secluded world only growing more hemmed in by darkness. That was until a miracle happened, of the most unspeakable kind. A decade after John was born, Sarah became pregnant again. For eight months, all seemed well. A sliver of hope emerged. But on the ninth month, a boil began to appear, just an inch or two above her navel, characterized by a great deal of pain. Like the ache in her abdominal area, Sarah ignored it as best as she could. But as the weeks wore on, nearing the ninth month mark of her pregnancy, the boil only increased in size and in pain until she could bear it no longer. When doctors visited her, they determined that she was fit for death and that there was no hope. Of course, Sarah was a fighter, but the village was not equipped with a surgeon willing to operate on her. Thusly, with no options, she sent for, of all people, the butcher. Turlow O'Neill arrived at the small home a broad-shouldered, brutish character with more experience in hacking flesh than carefully removing it. And though butchers were thought to be inured to gore, few things could prepare him for what he saw. The abscess on Sarah's stomach had broken open, and protruding through that wound was the elbow of an infant, missing the rest of its limb. Sarah was in a rocking chair, padded with blankets and pillows, spattered with blood. The butcher then found the rest of the fetus's limb, it was a blackened, shriveled husk, dismembered, and on the table beside her. In Sarah's hand was the knife, the implement she'd used to relieve herself of the sight, now being offered to the butcher. Perhaps lacking experience, Turlow was not entirely without reason. Before continuing, he administered a strong dose of sack, a fortified white wine from Spain. It was the nearest thing to an anesthetic on hand. After making a clumsy incision, he was able to reach in and take hold of the rest of the fetus and extricate it. Naturally, it had expired long before Sarah had removed part of the arm that had extended from her body. But when the butcher removed the stillborn, there was something else that he found, something much worse. A form so blackened that it was impossible to miss. Once more he reached inside, finding not Sarah's rotted tissue, but bones. A mass of tiny bones, as if her very insides had been the graveyard for another infant for a great many years. Throughout the coming days, yet more bones were found and removed. Remarkably, Sarah mended from the trauma of that event and survive. Eventually, word of the situation spread to the village's dean, who contacted doctors in Dublin, who invited and urged Sarah to seek long-term care in an infirmary in the city. The dean even donated the four pound required to fund her travels and stay. Meanwhile, the claims of the findings were investigated, and to the utter shock of the professionals, determined to be true. After great reluctance, Sarah did indeed leave her home. But after her arrival in Dublin, word of her all but vanished. Her stubbornness to stay in the village stemmed from her worrying about her son. Even though her husband planned to accompany her in her travels, something in her mind seemed to tell her that her ten-year-old would stay behind all the while, and who would look after him. At long last came the unspoken truth. The source of the rumors now silenced by the collective sadness of what had occurred inside that home. 
John, Sarah's most treasured child, had never been born in the first place. A phantom pregnancy, her husband called it, brought to fruition only on that night with the butcher, marked by nothing else than a blackened pile of bones. Before we wrap up this episode, allow me to thank all the sponsors of today's show, which is only you, our dear listeners. Mania is propped up by its guests, and if you'd like to take part in building up the Grim Theater, visit patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grim. It is with great displeasure that I confirm the majority of this story is told with as much historical accuracy as could be afforded. Though the claims still sound dubious today, the professionals who investigated it attested to its veracity. What was changed for the sake of today's story was the complicated and tedious nature of events regarding Sarah's health and pregnancies. In fact, even the historical accounts are muddied, as those who investigated it found it difficult to talk with the family to set the record straight, such was the extent of their lack of education and communication skills. You'll be thankful to hear that Sarah's life was not so plagued by death. She did, in fact, bear several children before the horrors of her miscarriage and the discovery of the bones inside her. The most shocking truth of the tale stems from the arm that protruded from the abscess on her stomach. It remains to be, at least from what I know, a verified claim. But what about the fact that all of this took place with a butcher inside her own home, and that doctors denied her any help? Let me answer that by saying that one of my favorite movies is Donnie Darko. In it, he says, Sometimes I'm afraid of what you might tell me. Sometimes I'm afraid that you'll tell me that this is not a work of fiction. And unfortunately, aside from the added invention of the phantom child, this is a piece of nonfiction. Thank you for joining me for another evening of peculiar terrors. As always, the theater is ever open to you. <laughs>